and welcome to the Barbatos Catholic Podcast, a show where two Mexican dads talk about faith, life, and culture. We are your hosts, Gustavo and Walter, and today we are going to talk with Steve Ray about how to keep your children Catholic. But first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by DiscountCatholicStar.com. They are your new go-to online shopping source for all traditional Catholic products. They have Catholic statues for indoor and outdoor use, statues from 8 inches to 24, 36, 48, and 72 inches tall. DiscountCatholicStar.com is your source for traditional Catholic statues. You can get a 15% discount on your first order with free shipping using the discount code BARBATUS, that is B-A-R-B-A-T-U-S. Visit DiscountCatholicStar.com today and use discount code BARBATUS at checkout to get 15 off on your first order. And now, to the show. And welcome back to the podcast. Today we have a, an amazing guest uh, in the podcast. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. You're seeing him for those who are uh, watching on YouTube. Uh, but after being raised in a fundamental Baptist family, Steve Ray was received into the Catholic Church on Pentecost Sunday in 1994, following a long faith journey that explored his Protestant roots. Prior to their conversion, neither Steve or his wife Janet had ever set foot in a Catholic Church. After studying many books to convince their best friend, a recent convert, that early church was evangelical, Steve and Janet backed their way right into the Catholic Church. Steve is a Catholic speaker, author, producer, pilgrimage guide, and frequent guest on EWTN. Steve Ray, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Good to be here and good to join both of you good guys. Good. It's wonderful it's to really see. Honored. It's wonderful to see young guys like you um, putting the most important things first, family and, and the Lord Jesus and the church. And uh, young guys usually have a lot of other things that they're chasing after but uh i love seeing guys like you starting out right thanks for calling us young you are <laughs> yeah, exactly uh, i'm 60 i'm 67 years old so it's pretty much everybody's young to me nowadays <laughs> there we go well, we're, we're slowly getting into that uh uh arena you know where somebody that's 20 calls you sir and you're like yeah. whoa that happened already <laughs> so yeah yeah so it's so great to have you on, Steve. Um, I little background. I ran into you a couple of weeks ago, maybe, maybe a month ago at the healing mass at St. Bernard of Clairvaux in Scottsdale. Um, so and for you or those of you that aren't familiar with Steve Ray, imagine Indiana Jones, right? But Catholic. So that's why I the saw hat. you. Exactly. <laughs> so I saw you uh, from afar and I'm like, that is Steve Ray. I'm just going to go up and introduce myself. But your Twitter handle is actually Jerusalem Jones, right? Is that why? Yeah, Twitter. Yeah, I got that name in a, ma uh, a magazine article early on when I started doing our documentary series, filming it overseas, um, all over Iraq and Turkey and Israel and Jordan and Syria, uh, doing the whole story of the Bible. And uh, so a magazine wrote an article about me and called me Jerusalem Jones instead of Indiana Jones because I spent so much time in <laughs> Jerusalem. My wife and I have been to Israel to the Middle East there over 180 times, just to just to Jerusalem, the Israel area. But that doesn't count Iraq and Jordan and Syria. That's in addition to the 180 times. So I guess that's how I got the name Jerusalem Jones. And in fact, if you go to www.jerusalemjones.com, it actually goes to my website. That's awesome. That's great. So yeah, and at that time when I ran into you, we had just switched this uh, podcast into more of an interview style. It used to be three Mexican dads talking about faith, life, and culture. Um, the, the third gentleman had to step down, obviously, to set priorities right. He had to put his family first, and a new business venture uh, became available for him. Um, so we said, there's a gap, you know? So we started uh, looking for people to interview and, and, and hopefully have uh, a lot more knowledge than we can bring to the table, that's for sure. So when I saw you, I said, you know, why not? Uh, we've been very fortunate to just come across people that are willing to come on the podcast. And um, sure. you were so nice and so gracious. And you gave me your information right there. And then you said anytime. So well, um, I like it what you guys do. And I like to support this kind of thing. So that's thank you so much. 
So um, I wanted to go back a little bit before we get into the topic about you backing your way into the Catholic Church. Yes, that's, uh, that's exactly what we did because I came from a um, very anti-Catholic family. My mom's 100 years old, by the way, right now. I'm going to go visit her today yeah. or tomorrow again. I read stories to her now because she read stories to me when I was in bed, little guy. Um, but we were raised in a pretty anti-Catholic family. And when a good friend of ours, and I don't know if we'll have time to go into more of the story, but when a good friend of ours who was a Protestant minister and talk show host on WMUZ in Detroit, Michigan, Protestant radio, when he... Uh, told us in 1993 that he was going to become a Catholic. It just, that just didn't register. There's no way my mind could grasp what he just said because <laughs> we had spent almost two weekends out of the w month together for the last couple of years, homeschooled our kids together. You know, we did Bible study together, everything like that. And all of a sudden he says, Steve, uh, Sally and I decided we're going to join the Catholic church. And I said, Al, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're way too smart to be a Catholic. How? What are you thinking about becoming Catholic? Well, that pretty much was the beginning of our journey because then I had come almost uh, seeing the problems within Protestantism had brought me up for the up to that point. My wife and I had seen a lot of problems in Protestantism. I was 39 years old, so I didn't do this when I was a teenager. This is something that. I'd been a Bible teacher and evangelist and so on for decades, two decades anyway. And to um, all of a sudden have my friend become Catholic put us on a journey. But the journey had already started in a way because we had become very discouraged with Protestantism. We saw a lot of problems with Protestantism. And sometimes, you know, especially for us guys, uh, we don't go see the doctor unless we get sick. There's something's wrong, right. then we're, our wives force us to go to the doctors. Right. And I had we had to see something was wrong with Protestantism before it, a door could be open to any alternatives. And we saw a lot of problems in Protestantism, almost became agnostic, I remember, almost I just frustrated oh, wow. by the whole thing. And then our friend converted, and then we tried to convince him was wrong, but over a period of time, we... Uh, prove to ourselves he was right. And so in a way, I'm saying that while we're fighting and fighting this way, I'm backing up, backing up. I go right back, backwards into the Catholic Church. That's so oh, funny. got it. I remember from one of your talks that I was watching in preparation for this episode that uh, you advise Protestants to not read the early church fathers unless they want to become Catholic. Oh. And I thought that that was genius. Stay away. <laughs> if you If you want to stay Protestant, if you don't want to ever consider Catholicism and you think it's a big cult and you think it's uh, a counterfeit of true Christianity, do not ever, ever read the fathers of the church. Do not read any documents outside the New Testament from the first two or three centuries because it is very subversive reading and it will corrupt your Protestant ways, let's put it that way. <laughs> so, and it will make you, it will force you to think about things that you've never thought of before. But I'll tell you one of the other things, and I've never really said this to people much, but another, there was another thread of influence in our lives at this time. And that was because my parents are getting older. I thought that I would write their life stories before they got too old mm -hmm. to and, you know, we have all the family pictures, so they're the ones that know who people right. are. And when they die, I'm not going to know who those people are. I just throw the pictures away. So I, I sat down with my mom and dad for several months, and I wrote their life story. I let them tell me the story, and I wrote it out, and I made a, a booklets of our whole family history from my mom and dad's side. And then uh, it struck me that I also have another family genealogy that I should be concerned with, and that's the genealogy of my family being a member of the kingdom of God. I'm a member, I've been adopted into the family of God, and I'm a Christian. And I wanted to, you know, it was so fascinating to learn about our our roots genealogically with my mom and dad and the countries we came from and so on, that I thought, let's do the same thing with the early church to see where they came from. Well, that's why I say to people, if you don't want to be Catholic, do not ever, ever, ever read those writings because those people were very Catholic. And they will make you think about things and see things and realize things you hadn't thought of before. 
So it, it's it's a funny way of saying you should read the Fathers of the Church, basically. <laughs> basically, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what were yeah, some of those wouldn't... problems that you saw in, in Protestantism? The first one started with my wife. We were coming home from church one Sunday at a, well, we, we went to several different churches, Evangelical, Presbyterian, some Baptist churches, different ones. And I taught Bible studies in these different churches. They asked me to come and do Bible studies. And we were driving home one Sunday from, I almost said mass. No, not mass, a church service. <laughs> and um, my wife said, I can't go listen to that man preach anymore and call it worship. She said, he might have been preaching and we sang and we stood up and we sat down, but it wasn't worship the way God expects us to worship him. And I'm not sure why. I don't understand it, but I just know there's something not right and we can't really call what we just did worship. Now, we didn't have any idea why she thought that or what the answer was, but it was a problem to us. Now, of course, Catholics know what was missing. It was the Eucharist. It was the whole liturgical worship of God, realizing that all of us together are there. It's the source and summit of our faith. It's the highest form of worship that you can have. But I have on the laptop I'm using right here that all the sermons of uh, Charles Haddock Spurgeon, who was one of the most famous Baptist preachers ever in the late 1800s in London, England. I've got all 66 volumes of his sermons. And in one of those, he said, there is no form of worship that is higher than a good sermon. And if you say that sermon is not the highest form of worship, you insult your minister. Now, my wife, instinctively knew that that wasn't true. There's no way that a sermon can be the highest form of worship. So this is what one of the issues that got us started. The same friend who was converting to Catholicism gave us a book by Thomas Howard called Evangelical is Not Enough. And it was all about liturgical worship. My wife read that book and all the lights went on in her head. I was busy with my business, but her the lights all went on and she'd say, Steve, listen to this. Steve, listen to this. And she said that book put into words everything she was thinking, but didn't know what to say or how to say it. And that was one of the problems and the little door cracking open to the whole idea of Catholicism and what, what worship was, liturgical worship. And then, of course, when you step into that, you see that, that there's, we, we were so bare bones as Protestants. We'd stripped down our worship service to just preaching. And now we realize that there was so, so much more and it was so rich and beautiful and mystical and heavenly and it made a big difference. So that was one of the issues. You want me to go to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Well, the next one, uh, the next one was how many, how many churches did Jesus start? So here I am driving. That's one easy to answer, but go ahead. It is. But if you, <laughs> but Walter, I, I can come back at you with that and say it's easy, yes. But if you come to the conclusion that there is no visible organizational church, mm. man-made, so to speak, or it's a hierarchical and there's a boss called the Pope, if you, if you say, well, no, that's not what Jesus meant by the church. He meant brothers and sisters in Christ who love one another and love him. And they accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And we're all kind of gathered together to sing in that. That's the church. And maybe you guys start your own little church, but we're all really unified in Christ, right? And that, this is how evangelicals think. There's no concept of a, an evangelical Protestant thinking of there being an organization called the church. It's always just me and Jesus. And I associate with other people who it's me and Jesus and we form a bond and we get together, but it doesn't, there's no necessarily um, inspired or authentic format. It can be Presbyterian. It could be the Methodist politics. It can be others. And, and so we, we had that idea of what the church was until we realized that there were so many different kinds and right on Main Street, you have on one corner, you've got Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, and Baptist on four corners and people are coming. And, and then you have black churches and that's probably one of the most divisive, segregated hours of the week is Sunday morning because black people go to black churches and Mexican people tend to go to Hispanic churches and Koreans go to Korean churches. And the Catholic church is really the only integrated church. 
everybody goes. Yeah. There isn't a black Catholic church or a Hispanic Catholic. They're all just Catholic church. So yeah. we realized that there was something very seriously wrong with this. And I, and I remember Jesus did not say, um, I will build my churches. He said, I will build my church. And then when I started to read back of the early church, the first couple centuries, those very, very dangerous church fathers, <laughs> that from the very shoot out of Christianity, when it first got started after Pentecost, there was always a concept that the church was a government, a visible unity. And even in the upper room, how many were in the upper room? Well, it says 120, about 120 were in the upper room. But it doesn't say 120 people. It says 120 names in the Greek. Very strange. So this always causes me to dig deeper. Well, I found that in the tradition of the time in the first century, that if you were going to break away from the main city uh, in Jewish culture, and you wanted to break away from the big city and go start a new city, you had to have 120 people to do that. Um, what is the church? It's a new community that's breaking away from the old community and it's a new community of Jews going to start their own called the Ecclesia, those who are called out to a new community. And they needed 120 people to do that. Now, this was not in the, and it says, actually, they needed 120 in order to set up their own judicial and their own court system, their own Sanhedrin. So what's happening here is the church is a governmental body. It is a city. It's a civic unity in a sense. It has its own law, canon law. It has its own courts. It is a governmental process. Now, I had rejected all of that, and the early church was very clear about that, that it was a governmental force, and it was the head was in Rome, and that it went out from Rome, and it, there was bishops, and, there, and it was all tied into one visible organization. And so that really rattled my cage. And I realized that on Monday afternoon, maybe I'm driving down Main Street with my wife and we see Burger King, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, KFC chicken or something. And I say, what do you feel like today? And she says, well, I feel like chicken. So er, we pull in and we get chicken. Maybe tomorrow she'll feel like a pizza. Now, Sunday morning, we drive down the road and we see Baptist and Lutheran and Methodist and Presbyterian and Pentecostal. And I say to my wife, what do you feel like today? And Americans pick their churches the same way they pick their restaurants. What do I feel like today? What do I think I should be able to do? Should I be able to abort and contracept? Well, then I'll find a church that fits what I feel like today. And Americans, maybe they like uh, the, the church that has the big bands with 10 sets of drummers and 60 guitars. You know, Maybe that's what you want, where you can get a cappuccino when you come in and drink your coffee while you're sitting there during the worship service, right? And they take those bratty little kids and they take them off to a nice little children's church. So I, I, I can enjoy this without stepping on Cheerios through the whole thing. So the whole, <laughs> the whole idea was that, that, that there was not, for the first thousand years, there wasn't where you'd go into a city and you'd start looking for a church you could join <laughs> that fit the way you think it should be. In fact, Augustine said, whenever you go, ask for the Catholic Church. There are many dens, dens of other groups, but always look for the Catholic Church because no one would dare call themselves Catholic, and that's where you'll find the true faith. So this is something that was another issue for us. How many churches did Jesus start? And what's the morality that goes right along with it? Mm -hmm. Because different churches teach yeah. different forms of morality. Does God just leave it up to us to decide? that I can abort or not abort. Well, if it wasn't as important enough to him to put in the Bible, it never says, do not abort, do not contracept. Mm -hmm. So he must have left it up for me to decide, right? Mm -hmm. But not yeah. realizing that he made a church that had a courts and legislature that would give us what God really wants more than what we can find black and white, just in the Bible alone. Totally. So did you know, uh, th did, were you cognizant of who had started the Baptist church when you were a Baptist? Did, did you ever get to that realization? Like, wait a minute, this was started by someone that was not yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but I, I would have easily brushed that aside by saying that Jesus, you know, got started and, and Catholics corrupted it. And, you know, and, and there were real Christians always in existence, but they were underground, so to speak. You know, they had... The outward Christianity had been corrupted, and there were many that then, after Martin Luther or Smith, who started the Baptist churches, or 
others, they came back up to the surface again and they brought real Christianity back. And it really didn't matter whether it was Luther or Smith or who it was, um, the, mm. the Wesley brothers with the Methodism. It, as long as they're loving Jesus and they get back to accepting Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior and you get to... See, we always believe Catholics had everything upside down, that um, we would get saved by faith alone. You guys got saved by works. We had the Bible alone. You had man-made traditions. We prayed to God. You prayed to dead saints. See, So as long as we have those things correct, it really doesn't matter whether we call it Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran. And that's why my wife and I, we move between Presbyterian and Baptist and Reformed and others, as long as, you know, that's, the general gospel was correct. Not realizing that you don't go out and start a new church when Jesus already started his church. And once you get that, once it gets that fish hook in your brain, that Jesus right. actually started a visible church with a visible leadership that has an address and one of the verses that made me come to that conclusion, my wife and I, is in, in Matthew 18, the second time the word church is used in Matthew's gospel. It says that if your brother sins against you, take it to your brother. If he doesn't listen to you, then take it to two or three more. Well, right there, you already have the Jewish law of you need witnesses to go to a court. Okay, so you go to two or three others. And if they won't, your brother won't listen to those two or three others, then take it to the church. Now, we would always say that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's the church. Wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, that's the church. But Jesus said, you take it to the two or three. And if he doesn't listen to them, then you take it to the church. He didn't say a church. So, okay, Walter, you and I have a problem today. You insult me on this podcast, and I've got to deal with this now. So I go over to Gustavo and I say, Gustavo, Walter said this about me on the podcast and uh, we have a problem, but Walter won't listen to you. So I go get two or three other people and I talk to them about it. Walter still won't repent and say he's sorry for this problem we have. So then now I'm supposed to take it according to Jesus to the church. Where is the church? Where is the church that I take it to? If I'm a Baptist and you're a Methodist, do we go to the Methodist church to deal with it? No, because it has no authority over me. And if I don't like what they do, I just walk away anyway and go join the, yeah. the, the Reformed church. So yeah. when Jesus says, take it to the church, where is the church? What's the address for? It? And it means that even if I'm in Germany or in Mexico or in the United States or Israel, that church is going to have to be there to be the adjudicator of our problem. What is the only church that's everywhere everywhere on the face of the earth? It's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. So when you say take it to the church, it now has meaning to it, where before it was nonsense. That's wow. amazing. It's kind of well, mind-blowing. <laughs> that could be an episode. I think it's an episode all on its own, Steve. You're a treasure trove of knowledge. <laughs> know. So, um, And that's how I kind of like got introduced to you. I first saw you on uh, the Catholic, National Catholic Men's Conference in 2021. Right. They held it uh, virtually because of COVID that time. And I remember they had a system where it was like talks for father, for a husband, for, as a Christian and as a, as a brother. Right. And the first one I clicked on for any reason, right, I was uh, intrigued of how to become a better father, a better Catholic father. And your talk was the first one I clicked. And it talked about how to keep your kids Catholic, which is the topic that we're going to discuss today. Um, and at that time, it was February and, and we had just kicked off the podcast, actually. So that's why I was like trying to get more resources and knowledge into my brain so I can do this with Walter. Right. So in that talk, you had mentioned um, your father of four and a grandchild, grandfather of what, 19 now? Yes, I'm printing out a picture right now. I should have had it for you before, but I'm printing out a picture to show you our family. Yes, That's I have four children. Um, we The oldest one is, I don't know exactly, but I know my wife can tell you their birth dates, all of them. I can't do that. <laughs> but the oldest one's about 43 or 44, and our youngest one is 30 or 31. So we have a range from the baby is 31 and just had a new baby. And I saw that in your the way you're going to close this up is say, I uh, get prayer to Solanus. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Our latest grandchild was named John Paul Solanus Regan. That's oh, his name. Oh, that's beautiful. That's amazing. And so, uh, yes, we have four kids. They all married beautiful spouses. We taught, but we didn't. We talked about that all the time. 
And I was involved, my wife and I, in their spouses. And we had the broken knee speech because I have three daughters and one son. And any boy that was interested in our daughters, even to be serious or to be friends with them, I'd say, bring them home. I want to meet them. And we would sit around the living room with my son, too, who's a burly guy. And uh, he, we would just say to them, so you like my daughter? Yes. And I said, well, then that makes you now accountable to me because I'm her father. <laughs> I've got a lot of money invested in that girl, a lot of time, a lot of love. We homeschooled her. And if you think you're going to mess around with my daughter, you got another thing coming, buddy. And if you ever touch her in a way that's improper that I would do, I will break both of your legs. And the kid would always go, ha, 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 ha. and my son says, don't laugh. Dad means it, and I'll help him. And, you know, the bad guys, they took off and never came back. The good guys stayed around, and my daughters now have three marvelous husbands who are devoted to them and to the Lord and raising those kids. And so it's it's not something that just happens. You want to keep your kids Catholic? You have to have a plan. you got to be involved. It doesn't just happen. It is part of a whole family culture. I used to say, and I still do, that our family is a unique club. You can't join it. Neither of you guys can join it. You have to get born into this club. Mm -hmm. It's a right. very exclusive club. It's one where we'll lay our lives down for each other, where we will spend time with each other. We'll take care of each other financially every other way because we're this special club and you can't just join it. You got to be born into it. And then I'd say to my kids, don't do anything stupid and get kicked out of this club. <laughs> this, club is a, this club is the best thing you guys got for the whole of your life. And don't ever do anything stupid and become alienated from this club. So it was always this idea that we're a family and our family is special and we're going to love each other. And we're not we're going to stick with what dad says because we want to stay a part of all of this. And that's kind of how we did our family. Uh, here comes the picture I'll show it to you now. This is a That's picture amazing. we took a year ago. Let's see it. Oh, upside down. There okay, there's my wife and I, and there's the two youngest ones and their kids. And then here's uh -huh. our two oldest. That's my daughter and her five kids. And there's my son and his eight kids. And Beautiful. you wouldn't wow. want to tussle with those guys. I mean, there's another club right there. It's a subset of our club. And you wouldn't want to mess with those guys. Look at those guys right there in the front. Look at those three little guys. You don't want to yeah, mess with yeah, those you guys. You don't want to mess with those. Heck no. I have, <laughs> so they are. I have uh, three boys and a girl. So I'm going to take a, a page from your book and do the same thing with the, the broken leg uh, conversation. Yep. And it's fun. Even one was a military guy. My daughter uh, met him on an airplane and they he was in Iraq and they corresponded by emails and they fell in love by email while he was serving in Iraq. And when he came home, he wanted to marry my daughter. And I said, bring him over. I have to give him the broken knee speech. And my daughter says, Dad, I'm already 24. He's as old as I am. He's just out of the military. You, I, When we're teenagers, yes, but not now you can't. And I says, bring him over. If he doesn't like it, if he likes it, then you'll know he's a good guy. So he came over and I said, mm -hmm. I said, I'm going, you got it. You're going to get the same speech everybody else did. You're going to marry my daughter if you want to marry her. That's good. We'll approve of that. But don't touch her until you marry her. And if you do, I'll break both your legs. And he kind of laughed. And I said, I know you're tougher than I am, but I'll get you from behind. <laughs> <laughs> so and so we, it was fun, too. We had some fun with yeah. it. But it made a point. I said, when you marry my daughter. All of you guys, when you marry my daughter, you're marrying them for a lifetime. Don't ever come back to me and say, I don't love your daughter anymore. We're going to split up. I said, because you're going to have me to deal with. And mm -hmm. if you think I'd break your leg when you're a teenager, you'll be, you won't will be have any idea what I'm going to do to you now. So don't ever tell me that you're going to walk away from my daughter. When you marry her in this family, you marry her for a lifetime. So, now, in Israel, they do this. My best friend in Israel lives in Nazareth. They're Christian uh, Nazareans. They're, they're Arab-Palestinian Christians. And they don't have divorce in Nazareth. When a husband and a wife don't get along, all the cousins and the uncles, they come and get that guy, and they take him out for a walk. And it's called, <laughs> they call it slap therapy. And they talk to him and say, don't, you're going to go back home right now, and you're going to work this out with our cousin or with our daughter or our sister. 
And he says, you'd be amazed how those marriages get corrected. Because he said, if we take you out for another walk, we're not going to be as nice as we were on this one. <laughs> there you go. This is family, That'll right? This totally. is family. Yeah. 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 Can't mess around with it. So in, in the spirit of family, and obviously being the most precious thing for, for us as men and as fathers, I don't have a son. I have two daughters, so I'll probably just have the bat right there with me so the guy knows I'm serious about this. <laughs> but what do you, how do you do it? You know, I mean, practical advice on how do you keep your kids Catholic, not only keep them Catholic, but really make them fall in love with Jesus. I would say in one sentence, your kids will love what you love. Overall, not every time, not to the same degree maybe, but children love what their parents love. If you guys spend all your time sitting on the couch, drinking beer and eating potato chips and watching sports, guess what your kids are going to do? They're either going to be disgusted with you and try to do something different, but more than likely, they're going to end up doing the same thing. If you go to Mass and you love the Lord and it's what you talk about at the dinner table and you have fun with it and you have challenges at the dinner table. We'd always have challenges. Oh, what would you do if somebody says this? Or I'd, I'd, after we became Catholic, I'd play the Protestant and I'd make my kids defend themselves. And we'd have a wonderful dinner. And you've got to bring, te treat your kids as equals in a sense and bring them into what you're doing. Don't say, oh, I'm going to go be a Catholic now and I'll see you guys later when we have dinner. No, when we homeschooled our kids. All of life was being Christian. All of life was integrated. Learning arithmetic wasn't different than learning religion. Re learning arithmetic was how God created the world. Look at how beautiful the numbers are. This is what God did. Look at how the all the magnificent numbers and trigonometry and calculus, all of this is the way God created the world. Oh, look at that hummingbird out the window. That thing, He's beating his wings 70 times a second. Can you imagine the pleasure God gets by watching that little creature that he made? That creature worships God just by doing what a hummingbird does. But if you bring every aspect of your life, Jesus Christ is the Lord of everything. So everything we do is related to that. Homeschooling is. Arithmetic is. Cooking is. Everything, how I love my wife. I made sure that my kids, this is another thing that dads need to do, is to defend their wives. Because these little kids think they're tyrants and they're going to come into the home and they're going to all of a sudden run the home and they're going to be brats and they're going to disobey and they're going to get the mom all upset and she gets all... <laughs> like this. I just said to our kids, your mom and I were lovers long before you came here and we're going to be lovers long after you're gone. And if you think for that short time you're in the house with us, I'm going to let you mess up my lovers and my relationship. It ain't going to happen, buddy. Mm -hmm. You are visitors here for 18 years. <laughs> and don't ever forget it. And they said, you love mom more than you love us. And I said, you're damn right I do. Her and I are one. We were made one by God. I'm not one with you. You are the offspring of her and me. And we love you because you're our child. But her and I have a special bond of covenant bond together. And when you're living here with her and me, you will never raise your voice to her. You will never say no to her. You will never disobey her because if you do, you have me to deal with. So in other words, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a dad and I believe in masculinity and I believe we're the head of the house. And my wife doesn't want to be the head of the house. My wife wants me to be the head of the house and discipline the kids. She wants to be the nurturer and the lover. Mm -hmm. She wants to be the, the one that loves and cuddles them. So I take the job of disciplinary, but it's all out of love. It's always done out of love and concern for them. And they never doubted that. To this day, our kids adore us because they know that we love them enough, first of all, to teach them at home. That's a big commitment to do that. And right. kids, when they grow yeah. up, they don't realize it when they're young. But when they get older, they go, holy smokes, mom and dad gave up cruises. They gave up big vacations. They gave up a lot of things that other families do because they loved us enough to stay home and teach us. Mm -hmm. And so you kids will love what you love. Incorporate Christianity and the Bible and the, the love of the faith and mass and prayers together. Um, they say the family that prays together stays together. That's true. But also the family that plays together stays together. Mm -hmm. 
going on hikes together, going out in the woods and doing nature hikes and taking bird books and binoculars with you and teaching them to love nature and make it a part of the of your family um, club. Make the yeah. family club so interesting and so much fun that they don't want to go anywhere else. Yeah, that's that's uh, something that my wife, Deanna, and I have been trying to, to do, like our family traditions, you know, starting with like liturgical living, um, how do we make uh, the saints uh, something that is like around our children uh, all the time? We have icons on the walls. We have crucifixes in almost every room. Those kind of things. It's like yep. people come in and it's like, are you guys Catholic? Um, <laughs> so they're immersed in this this bubble. You know, when uh, Gustavo and I homeschool, uh, we kind of like lean on them because our oldest is six. But what you said, it just resonates with uh, what my wife and I are trying to do it's just some people is like well they're they're, they're going to be in this do you want to keep your kids in this bubble and yes of course like yeah that's exactly what we're trying to do <laughs> and but it's um, not that it's not that um I I taught my kids to be afraid of everything I didn't right. teach my kids to be afraid of me I taught them how to think about everything when my daughter was seven years old, I took her downtown Detroit to a rock concert. I had the youngest date in that rock concert down in Joe Louis Arena. It was a rock and roll band. Everybody is smoking marijuana and doing all this. And I've got my seven-year-old daughter with me. Everybody looked at me like I was some kind of a nut. Who's he with that young girl with him here? We were out until two in the morning that day. But I wanted her to see how those people live. I wanted her to see that. And she now... 43 years old, she'll still tell people the reason I never got involved in drugs and that's because my dad took me to a rock concert when I was seven years old and I saw how those people lived and they walked out and they puked all over the parking lot. She said, and I made up my mind, I was never going to do drugs or drink and I didn't want to live like that. Now, I could have kept her away from that. I said, oh, no, 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 you can never see a rock and roll band. You can't see people on drugs. Yeah. Oh, I'd rather have her see them and understand it. So we ne we did we kept them in a bubble cuz Paul says bad company corrupts good morals. You let your kids get in with the wrong company, it's going to corrupt their morals and that will be their new club. They will lose you as a club. You will only be secondary. Their gang or the street kids or the kids in the public school that they get attached to will become their new club and that new club is not going to serve them well. But we homeschooled, but we had them in the Boy Scouts and in dance class. I took them downtown Detroit to see the prostitutes. What, what, no, what kind of dad are you anyway, right? Well, I wanted my daughter to see how some girls live. This is what some girls do. And they do this because their dad didn't love them, maybe, or maybe they got involved in drugs and they did this. So I, I wanted my, and here's how it worked. There was an album that my daughter heard about, a heavy rock metal album. And she, she was curious about it and said, Dad, could maybe could we get that album? I said, sure, let's go. This was back when they had records. You guys are probably too young to even remember that. 33 and a third records. And anyway, so I went to the record store and we got her that album. And she, we brought it home and she handed it to me. I said, why'd you hand it to me? I don't want to listen to it. She said, well, aren't you going to listen to it first and see if it's okay for me to listen to? I said, heck no, you're a smart girl. You go up and listen to it and you come back down and you tell me if it's good enough for you to listen to or not. An hour later, she came back down and handed me the album again, said, dad, this isn't a good album. We should take it back. Now, this is the way you want to teach your kids to think. You don't want them so afraid of the album that someday they're going to just want it because it's the forbidden fruit. Rather, get the album, listen to it together. Now, I'm not talking about pornography and damaging yeah, things yeah, yeah. like that. Right, right, right. But the things that are in our life and our culture, um, go to an abortion clinic and stand outside and pick it with the people in an abortion clinic. First of all, teach them to be a radical. Kids love to be radical. They love a fight. Kids, especially a boys, they love a fight. They love confrontation, video games. <coughs> boy, good and going to an abortion clinic and protesting all these things. This is cool for a boy. Get him in there. Make it a make it a, a challenge, you know, and, and then to talk about what that girl's going to do to that baby. Look at that. She's going in there. What's she going to do to that baby? That baby's going to get all chopped up and put in the trash. What do you think about that? Well, then this is the way you introduce your kids to the real world, but you do it in the safety of the family and you teach your kids how to think about things without telling them you can't do this, you can't do that, but rather let's discuss why we shouldn't do that. I want you to tell me why we shouldn't do that. Yeah. And that's what we nice. try to do here. We try to invite conversation um, and, and that spark interest in things, right? 
the reason that we homeschool is like we want to make sure that our kids love learning not just fill right. themselves with like information that yes it's useful but to become critical thinkers because in the world that's what's needed right now we we don't need it people is. that are followers we, we need people that lead by example and i gotta say it you know it's not a good world there to learn those values right now no. so so totally i think um it, that's another thing that connected with me when i first uh heard you speak the homeschooling aspect because we've been doing it now for close to 10 years uh, uh walters has a little younger children but it we're kind of like on in, in the, on, on the same path so as as you're saying it it just makes obviously a whole lot of sense uh and that's a lot of the reasons why why we started doing it but um it's the best thing you can do so you guys still have young kids but i'll tell you you saw the picture of my kids our kids and us are all best friends now why because we made mm -hmm. the investment in them and now we're all best friends when something happens our daughters immediately call mom they want to talk to mom about it whether they're having a problem with the baby or whether they've just got something exciting who's the first person they call mom yeah. Who, where do they want to go? Come over and see mom and dad because we're best friends. We every year they I love it when my kids say, dad, we're planning a big. Fa I used to do this. Now they do it. My son will say, dad, we just rented a big house in Tennessee and uh, we're all going to go down there. Come on down and join us. And we're going to have all all of us stay together for a week down there. Well, they love the family still. See, it's because of the investment. And I would also make make homeschooling fun, though. You can make it too rigid, too structured in a way, maybe uh, make it fun, make it have a good time. A lot of the times when our kids, if you would have come to our house, you wouldn't even known we were doing homeschooling. One kid's laying on a couch <laughs> reading a book. Another one's out in the backyard catching butterflies for their new butterfly collection. And the daughter might be cooking a cake or making dinner for tonight. But that's all homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Homeschooling just isn't alpha uh, reading and writing and arithmetic. Homeschooling is learning how to incorporate all of life under the lordship of christ everything is homeschooling so people think well when our kid is six we're going to start homeschooling no you started homeschooling when they were born you taught them how to go dad dad mama you taught them how to go one two three green blue yellow those that's homeschooling and all that homeschooling is is you continue to do that when they're six years old and seven years old and um, you get the, the textbooks and things. See, we started homeschooling when it was illegal in Michigan. We were the, one of the pioneers. There was no curriculum. They didn't have curriculums for homeschooling. Nobody did homeschooling. Nobody even heard of homeschooling. But my wife said, I'm not going to send my kids away for the best eight hours of their day and let someone else teach them. First of all, one out of five kids is graduating, can't read and write. Plus, they are being taught that they crawled up out of the muck an evolution. She said, my kids, I'll guarantee they can read when they graduate. And my kids will know they've been created by God and they're made in his image. And so she made up her mind in 1976 that we we're going to homeschool our kids when they came along. And so when we did, it was illegal. Parents who did homeschool in Michigan had their kids taken away and put in foster homes no for kidding. educational neglect, educational neglect. And the parents wow. are put in jail. So we bought an old farmhouse and we moved way out in the country and we disappeared. Now you could say, well, they were just, look what they were doing. They were keeping their kids in this protective little bubble. Everybody said, you're going to destroy your kids, their social life. They're not going to understand the social yeah. life. They're not going to have any ability to, co to communicate and to work with other people. I said, nonsense. We lived out in the country there and we disappeared, but we were in Boy Scouts, we were in Girl Scouts, we had we had a whole little farm out there with goats. And so when we first started talking about sex, my daughter says, Dad, Dad, I already know, I already know, I see what the goats do and then the goats have babies. So, you know, when you have, when you live that way, it makes teaching your kids about sex real easy. It, it, it's, it's just part of talking about Nature. life it's not like all of a sudden when they're 13 we're going to have this big conversation the dad starts to sweat and he's reading books and said okay daughter we're no 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 start talking to your kids about sex when they're five years old when the when the one dog jumps up on the other dog and starts humping on the dog you saw what you talk to the girl what's happening you know, this is how the babies are made then there's going to come and say well did you and mom do that well then you then that's a whole new you know conversation whole different but, conversation yeah but it's but the my yeah. point is is that homeschooling is not something separate from real life. And 
making it all part of the Catholic family and making homeschooling fun and not not something that kids hate, but you can make it fun along the way. Yeah, yeah, the loving the Lord, loving learning, all integrated. All right. I, I love that, what you said, on, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That right, is and I know I'm a little graphic right when I talk, but I'm talking to two guys, and I know it's for Mexican dads, oh, uh, right. Hispanic dads. I'm not talking to moms here, but moms can listen, of course, but I'm, I'm an earthy guy. This is why our kids grew up the way they did, because I'm an earthy guy. I'm not pretentious. I'm not religious. My religion, my religion is part of my daily life, and the kids knew that, and now they're the same way. But um, and I know I'm talking to you, and you said you, this is a show for Mexican dads. So good, uh, let's talk earthy because Mexican dads are earthy guys. They're down to earth, and we should talk straight. It, yeah, I totally I love it. Appreciate that um, because we need more of this. We need more honest conversation, right? I mean, a, a lot of people are just walking on eggshells around each other all the time, and that really dilutes the dialogue. I think there's a <laughs> lot of problems, and we're not gonna get to the solution of them by making. Ooh, should I say this? Should I say that? And again, that's one of the things that it's so uh, uh, captivating about hearing you speak because you you are like that. You know, you're not you don't hold back any punches. You're very respectful and you're obviously very knowledgeable. And I think you need both those things to to be able to have a conversation with people, not be confrontational, but be able to. Uh, speak your mind and stand up for what you believe. And yep. that's what we're yep. trying to do here, right? I mean, we're trying to uh, put our little grain in the sand of how to stand up for our families. What can guys do? Guys with young families like like we are, right? We're not trying to make something that we're not. We're, we're The Lord meets us where we are. And where we are right now is in this journey that we have young families and we have different challenges like you had different challenges. But it's about learning. It's about growing and, and nurturing that that faith. And you're an amazing resource to do that. So we didn't really get into the catalog of of your treasure trove. But um, for those of you uh, that have followed Steve, you know, he has written several books. He does pilgrimages to the Holy Land and other places, as he alluded to. And i um, going to do a plug for you here. You also have a conference coming up, right? <laughs> Well, I'm speaking at 20 different places over the year already and 10 international pilgrimages. We're going overseas 10 times with groups to five times to Israel and um, to actually in two weeks, we're leaving for our Saints and Shrines of Italy pilgrimage. Uh, but yeah, we have a conference. I, I would uh, recommend go to my website, catholicconvert.com and click on the pilgrimage link. There's a lot of stuff on my website, by the way, yeah. hundreds of documents to help families and and apologetics and Bible study and conversion stories and all that. And I put up a daily blog. I try to help keep people educated on what's going on. But um, I also have go to the catholicconvert.com, click on the pilgrimage link, and then I've got my upcoming pilgrimages. In July, we have one going to Wisconsin, and that's local. So it's easier for people to go to kind of in the heartland of America. So it's easy for people uh, to go there than to Israel or Rome or something. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have a, a pilgrimage through the, sh the shrines of Wisconsin. We're going to have a mass with Cardinal Burke, one of the true princes of the church. And then right connected with that and overlapping, we're going to have a, my first uh, annual co conference. We're calling it Love Being Catholic. And the theme of it is being in the world, but not of the world. And I've got, you guys heard of Father Dan uh, Don Calloway, who wrote the book on the mm -hmm. consecration. Joseph, he's, he's agreed to come and speak at my new conference. And Father Chris Alar, who is the one who wrote Understanding Divine Mercy, he's going to be there. We've got probably the best Catholic comedian in the country. He's going to come and we have a big banquet dinner, and he's going to do his Catholic Comedy Club for us show. So uh, we're going to stay at the Radisson Hotel in uh, La Crosse, and we're going to have this wonderful conference with banquet dinners and uh, great talks and sharing and a good a lot of humor as well. So that's in July called the uh, Saints of Sh uh, Saints of Wisconsin and the Love Being Catholic Conference. Well, what I love about that's your awesome. conference is that it has a first annual before the name. So that's we can right. More, right? That's right. That's I want to do this uh, because I think I also want to have a conference be fun. That's why we're having the comedian come in. We're going to have good food and wine with the dinners. You know, Christianity and go. Catholicism should be fun. That's Hospitality. Beautiful. 
making yes. people feel welcome. Yep, I love that. that's right. That's and there's I'm... not going to be any masks or anything either. I don't, I don't buy into that. <laughs> Neither does anybody else at this point. You know, I mean, so at this point, just... yes, we're good. <laughs> um, so CatholicConvert.com for uh, that's kind of like your hub for everything that, that yep. you have going on pilgrimages, books, uh, blog, website, uh, resources and whatnot. Um, are you on any social media platforms? Yeah, I do. And you can get to them from my website, too, because on there I have okay. a link to my YouTube, to Twitter, to Facebook, to all the different things I do. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm on Jerusalem Jones on Twitter, Twitter. Yep. Twitter.com forward slash Jerusalem Jones. And I, and I put things up there all the time and uh, Facebook as well. You can go to my homepage to find that. And Perfect. those are the main things that I do now when I travel, like when I'm leaving in two weeks to go to Italy, we're going to start in Milan and we're going to work our way following all the saints and shrines of Italy all the way down to Rome with, we got 41 people going with us. And every night I'll put up a video, a YouTube video, a 15, 20 minute video of our day. So people can actually join us on a virtual pilgrimage through Italy. And if you go to my website, it'll take you to the pilgrimage site, past pilgrimages. For the last 10 years, I have made a two hour video of every single pilgrimage we've taken. So you can, you can experience a pilgrimage to Ireland, to Guadalupe, to Poland, all the Catholic sites, oh, many, many, all through Israel, all through Jordan, all the biblical sites. So they're all there too. And you can kind of take a virtual pilgrimage. And I've made those and I love, it's kind of a hobby of mine to make the videos as we travel. That's awesome. Well, That's awesome. hopefully now we I have, have Yeah, hopefully we have the opportunity to join you in person in one of those trips. Well, we'd love to have you. I think we do them better than anybody else. I don't mind saying that. We sure got a lot of experience with it. They're more expensive than others. But when you look at the end price, we don't charge yeah. you anything on the, site, on the site. We charge upfront everything. Other groups give you a low price, get you hooked. And then when you're there, you pay extra for everything. I don't do that. And we have wine with all of our dinners. We have nice restaurants. We have good hotels. We have the best Catholic guides everywhere we go. And Beautiful. I'm with the group the whole time. My wife and I, too, sharing and talking along the way on the bus. Awesome. That's amazing. Well, we want to thank you so much for your time and for being so generous with it and coming to talk to us. Uh, we really appreciate you and, and the, the work that you're doing in your ministry. And uh, if we want to thank our listeners for listening to this episode of Arbatis Catholic Podcast, a show where two Mexican dads talk about faith, life, and culture. If you like the podcast and got something out of it, please... Uh, share review subscribe comment you, you know what you got to do and if you don't like the podcast well just keep it to yourself and let <laughs> others make their own mistakes <laughs> go to uh direct.me forward slash barbatus for all of our show notes social media how to support the podcast if the spirit moves to you and more and uh bless us casey pray for pray us. for us until the next time